Welcome back, um, and thank you for joining us for this, our program on inclusion at the heart of ESG. Earlier today, we had a wonderful session on the, the just transition. And then most recently, we had a very good session with Juliet, and Jane, and Virginie. Um, and during that, um, Jane made the very important comment that everybody here can start to make a difference. And Virginie also chimed in by talking about different ways that we can make a difference. Well, I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Gina Miller, someone who has definitely made a difference. Gina is a prominent businesswoman, a passionate philanthropist and responsible capitalist who has campaigned in the areas of investment and pension reform, political tra transparency and scrutiny, modern slavery, social justice and the charity sector. She's also probably one of the best known members of the UK investment profession. And there are a couple of reasons why she is so well known. First, following the financial crisis, Gina and her husband Alan founded SCM Direct, a digital wealth management company centering on transparency, low cost and investing with ethics. And in 2012, they then launched a transparency initiative, the True and Fair campaign, calling for an end to ripoffs and dubious practices in the UK investment and pension industry. Their work through this campaign has resulted in contributions to three EU directives which have resulted in over consumers across Europe benefiting from enhanced consumer protection. And the second reason why Gina is part of our consciousness is that in 2016, she successfully challenged the government over its authority to implement Brexit, winning in both the High Court and Supreme Court. She has maintained a watching brief of the UK government's activities most recently as leader of the True and Fair Party. Perhaps it should come as no surprise that Gina, alongside Theresa May, is the subject of a new play that opens, I think, this evening at the Riverside Theatre, which is called Bloody Difficult Women, a pluralisation of a comment that I believe Ken Clark made about the past Prime Minister rather than about Gina. But Bloomberg has described Gina as an establishment wrecking ball, um, though her drive for transparency, scrutiny and integrity is about reform, not wrecking, and her areas of work cover investments, charities, democracy and political processes, as well as, as I say, social justice. And as a passionate believer in responsible capitalism, um, she believes we all have a civic duty to be actively engaged in challenging contemporary issues. As a consequence of her experiences during Brexit, Gina launched a book on her life lessons called Rise. And Gina, in that book, you say that you have become the person you are today because of both the successes and failures in your life. You write, there have been challenges along the way, but these challenges taught me more about what it is to be strong than any amount of triumph or happiness. They also taught me how important it is to fight for what you believe in and for the kind of world you want to live in. I suppose I should start by asking how inclusivity characterizes the kind of world you want to live in. Oh. Thank you so much, Will, and uh, thank you for inviting me to chat with you today. Um, I often think that the words carry a meaning that then leads to the actions. And we get sort of, we, we, we focus and become almost obsessed with words such as diversity, inclusion, fairness. And actually, what, how do they then affect what happens around us? And I think particularly in the business world that often diversity and inclusion are synonymous and somehow there's this idea that one leads to the other and i think this is mistaken because i think that they are actually two quite different things um diversity relating to the full spectrum if you like of human differences so both visible and invisible, so age, gender, disability, um, social, economic status, uh, marital status, sexual orientation. But inclusion is about, I think, the arms around. What is it that an environment makes you feel like? Do you feel valued, respected, welcomed? Um, it's Inclusion is about an environment. So I think the two sit side by side. But I would argue that because one is seen as being the same as the other may explain why we haven't made the advances that I think we could have made professionally and socially, because we hold up champions of diversity as meaning that we've tackled inclusion. Do you, do you think that perhaps that 
sort of focusing on on diversity was a necessary first step um, to make sure that we were um, bringing all the right voices or that all the right voices have the potential to be at the table. But that where we are now, I don't know really if we've improved our record on diversity nearly sufficiently, but now perhaps it is appropriate to start focusing on making sure that when all the right people are in the room, they're not just in the room, but actually also able to be heard. In interesting, because uh, let me pick to being in the room, I think is probably one of the things. I'm always obsessed with the etymology of words. And inclusion, if you go back to its origins, is about shutting in. It's about closing. It's actually about a safe space. So, or closure and, and including and bringing up barriers. So bringing people in the room was probably where the problem started, is we thought that by bringing people into the room, we were going to tackle these issues. And we didn't actually look at what happened outside the room, because it's about, at every level, it's not the one room, it's the entire building, if you like. Um, so I think, for me, I've always been concerned about, you know, I've started in the city in 1996, and I have to say that I'm more worried now than I was then, because the discriminations and the misogyny and the uh, lack of opportunity was much more out there. It, now it's so much more nuanced in a way it's more difficult to call out. Um, but I think that uh, if we had perhaps appreciated, and it's something I try to talk about, is equal equality rather than diversity. Um, because the problem with pushing a single agenda is that there's this perception that somebody loses. So when you push one agenda, then somebody else is going to lose or hurt or feel that they need to then be being angry at something. Whereas if you push a much more positive agenda, which is about equality of opportunity and openness, then what you're saying is everyone has the same opportunity. There should be no barriers to opportunity and it shouldn't be about external or internal biases. Um, it's about encompassing everything that we are and ensuring that the best people, there are no barriers to the best people being promoted. And that's caused a lot of problems for me personally, I have to say, Will, in that some of the more, um, I'd say the diversity champions, the racial equality champions, think that what I'm saying is is wrong, that we need to have positive discrimination, we have to champion diversity, we have to get so many people on board level. But I would argue that board level, and that doesn't create an inclusive environment. It doesn't create a, an environment which promotes equality and fairness. What it says is it creates an environment that says you are worth more than, I, than somebody else. So I would get away from worth in those sorts of narrow terms and talk about open inclusion. Yeah, I, I I can see that. I suppose my challenge would be that if we don't change things, if we don't promote a different approach, it can be quite difficult for those people whose voices have not been heard before to start to be heard. And there is a danger that if we don't promote more explicit um, measures around diversity and inclusion, that um, we don't we don't we don't make the progress that I think you and I both 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 hope we we will make because it would remain difficult for new voices uh, to be to be in, in, you know admitted into the discussion. So I understand the. But is, but, but, well, it's not about in, include. It's about allowing people to speak. Because uh, it, it, this doesn't start, you know, the, allowing people into an environment where they don't feel included and they don't feel that they can speak up and represent themselves. And actually, you're, you're then what you're doing is you're you're paying lip service. So, and also, I'd say it even starts earlier than that. Even something that has always caused me concern is this idea. And years is that yes, we open these opportunities, these promotions to everybody, but goods don't apply. Um, I've heard that as, as an excuse on so many occasions. And I go back to the early process of recruitment. Just look at something as simple as how are you writing your job description? You know, are you, implicit, are you unconsciously creating exclusion in the way that's written and the language you're using? Let's go back to very, almost to basics. Um, some of this is beyond us as a profession, it's actually societal. But I think if we concentrate on on a corporate, uh, us as a profession, I think it's about 
diversity speaks to who's in the team, if you like. But, um, inclusion focuses on the whole game. It, it, it's much bigger than that. But I think sometimes, uh, you know, being able to use like language, because language does change over time, and putting that on your website, putting that in your brochures, almost lets companies off and lets organizations off because they can then point to it and say, well, we have this, you know, we have an inclusion diversity agenda. We have an inclusive organization. We have promoted X, Y, Z to the board. That doesn't change the fact that somebody doesn't want to come in to your organization. And then, of course, there's the issue of trust, which I think we'll get on to. But I, this, is much, it, this is not, to use the phrase, a black and white argument. And that's why I think from my experience being in this field, being in, you know, as I say, back all, all the way back to 1996, is that I've seen too many examples. Uh, 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 there have been easy let outs for people to say, well, I, well I've done that. I can move on now. Um, okay. and, and I think it, it's, an, it's an ongoing process. And we have to listen to people in the organization all levels to see if they feel that the programs are working. Yes. You're, you're very good at spotting situations and circumstances that don't operate to the proper benefit of the end user of our, the, the, the services of our profession. And you mentioned sort of the, there are some organizations that might be paying lip service to the diversity and inclusion agenda. How do you, what are some of the hallmarks of that? If you're talking to somebody, how, you know, when do you, when do you, when does your radar go off? And what's it, you know, how, how can you tell the difference between a sort of a more genuine approach and one which is perhaps more superficial? So I'll give you some almost comical examples um, and then sort of some more serious. Remember, um, quite a, probably after the financial crisis, so going back, you know, 10, 11 years ago, and going to see a particularly large, well, major, major bank, bank, one of the big five, and them saying to me, oh, Gina, we are now embracing our female clients. And uh, and I said, oh, that's fantastic. And they said, well, we now like lunch offering on our menu. And we've changed our brochures to pink. And I thought, OK, that's not really what this is about. So, so that's a sort of a you know a, a slightly lighter, humid version of it. But those where I walk into an organisation, and you can tell very quickly from talking to people within the organisation if people feel happy, the mood and ten the tone and tenor of an organisation, and when people feel nervous. When I go in, I quite often do networking events. Uh, pre-COVID, of course, um, networking events with, with minority groups or women initiative groups or whatever diversity groups are, you can tell from their ability to be free and these organizations yeah. have to flourish in these organizations and have, in a way, very challenging uh, or allow the organization. That's working. The ones who are much more prescribed in what they're allowed to say and do, I would suggest are not working. So it's allowing to have a diverse voice and a one that speaks up and allow a thought and that sort of neurodiversity in, in the open that the organization is doing well. And I think this is a point that you've made in the past, which is that financial services and perhaps the investment sector is, is not designed really for um, to work sort of in the way that our consumers, our customers would really like to work with us. And I suppose what you're saying is that in, in some ways, organizations that get this right are those that are listening to their stakeholders, listening to their own teams and allowing them to work in the ways that they want to work. And there's a consequence they then feel heard. Is that a, a fair reflection yes, of, your, of your views? The prescription or presuming that you know I mean, you know, it, 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 that isn't always best. But I think, it, you know, there are there is this feeling that if you follow a particular set of protocols, then you're doing the right thing. But those protocols and that agenda is being set by people who are quite removed from the consumer distance. I mean, I, I'd say one of the problems I have with our industry as a whole, there are two things, two big picture items. 
we underestimate how valuable are to society. I think we haven't how to tell our story of our societal cap and talk about social capital that is ever going to be able to provide what we do. And so I think we have the rest of, uh, under our own importance um, and what we offer the end consumer. So I think if we could find a different way of communicating our value to society, to wider society, then that benefits us. It's not an individual company. I think that's as an industry. Um, um, but moving on, I'd say that, uh, you know, what we need to do is is remember that quite often the board and the uh, uh, in the, the senior management who removed from the end client. Look at the US, for example, how many independent members of boards sit in the US. It's so different to the way we operate in the UK. And the, they bring that voice to the, of the consumer to the board. You know, I, I published this thing back in uh, September 2020 about the sort of a 10 action points for the FCA uh, to adopt to try and enhance and uh, uh, integrity uh, in the industry. And one of the things I talked about was exactly that, was the idea that, you know, we follow that um, U.S. fund model where we have, um, you know, where the board majority are independent directors. And I think there are lessons to be learned from that. If we could narrow the gap from the senior level. Yeah. Mm. I mean, we have obviously in the UK made some progress in terms of that, and there's more of a role with for independent members of, of fund boards, and they are now required to pay more attention to value for money. And that's something that I know you've spoken about a lot, and we at CFA UK have commented on, and we did a review and found that um, a lot of those reports were, were wanting. There were many very good examples, and there were unfortunately too many poor examples. Okay. Um, and actually, one of the, the, the areas that um, some of those fund boards spent too little time talking about was the integration of ESG factors. And that, that I suppose, brings me back to your first point about uh, representing the value of the work that the investment sector does to society. Um, and one of the things that I find exciting about um, ESG and sustainable investing is because it, I think it does allow um, us to 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 more obviously show what it is that we can do and how we can help drive positive societal change um, but i wondered what your view was on on esg and the the development of esg investing and whether or not we've already broken it by um failing to to take enough care of esg as a brand it's a really interesting and I, again, have been quite critical about this because, again, you know, is anything really that new? Back in the, the 90s, you know, I was one of the proponents talking about then the triple bottom line of people, profit and planet. So, you know, the fast forward, uh, which is environment, sustainability, governance. We haven't, you know, it, it's a different guise, but really the sentiments on the lot that different. And at that time, originally the sort of late 90s, the issue that we could not overcome as a, as a group of supporters was around benchmarking. So that was an issue that at the time we found difficult to sort of, and, and even the academics in the field who were, very, who were very respected and renowned found that challenge because some perception, your perception of what is ethical would be quite different perhaps for mine, um, what you see is the government maybe. So you have that personal perception problem uh, to overcome. But I think there are some things we could do as an easy win. And I'd say there is too much on the ethical ESG agenda. They're concentrating on the E. There hasn't been so much on the S and G. And we need to do more work on that to make sure that they're all three of them, because some of the funds um, that are being that are scoring quite well, and I this is something we highlighted with Morningstar recently, is that you know you can you can well there's so many problems, but you know you can have a good ESG score for three years running and then suddenly are on a particular scoring in, in, in Morningstar or you can actually be scoring really well on the E but really badly on the S and G and then you still actually manage to get a good um, there's also the self-certification issue. 
care if you put the words in your prospectus that you are pursuing a particular filter on ESG, suddenly you are an ESG fund, even though when you look at the underlying holding, not. So I think we have to address the fact that we haven't globally, and this is not just, again, a US, a UK issue. We need to come to a place where we agree at least some basic benchmarks and some basic uh, rules and regulations on ESG because ESG is growing before the, it, it, it's almost the trend and the consumer uptake is happening before we've actually agreed those basics. And if you look at the profile of the new ESG consumers, those who are seeking to do good and get good returns, they are much more um, naive investors. So far more younger generation and yet far more women who are not so sophisticated. And it's fantastic because we are, we're getting a new audience, a new consumer base into our sector, which is really exciting. But I worry that we could be exploiting those by the, got the, the um, governance, regulation, and transparency in the ESG sector, their yeah. desires and enthusiasm. I mean, I, I think there's so much to be done on this. The, the quick win, which I think is something we should do across the sector anyway, because we're so lagging behind the US on this, is about transparency. It's 2004 in the US. They have had to publish all fund holdings. So all funds have had to have 100% transparency of funds of 2004. We're now in 2022. We still don't have that in the UK. But if we had that across the board, including the ESG funds, you would quickly be able to identify those funds that are greenwashing. Um, and I think quite some way to, to because some of this is nudging behaviors. You don't have to re. It's about so I think transparency is an important tool in that nudging of So I think I would say, and I keep talking to the FCA about this, you know, please introduce transparency of holdings. I mean, we had this in, in Woodford. We had, you know, if we have it in liquidity issues, we've had closet index tracking, whatever the issues are, quite a few of these could be transparency of holdings. Yeah, indeed. And just to sort of, I suppose, bring you back to sort of the, the sort of um, ESG and sort of greenwashing. I mean, I think that one of the challenges is that um, you know, many funds are are sort of advertising themselves as ESG, but what they're talking about is actually we are taking ESG factors into consideration with, exclusively when we're thinking about the portfolio. We're not trying to affect people and planet at all. And we don't seem to have a good way to differentiate. So no, we actually do care about people and planet and, and, and others who say, no, we don't really care about people and planet, we care about the portfolio. And those two things, I think we do need to be more explicit about the, the, the difference between them. But just to come back to your point about the sort of the, the this next generation of investors, because as we saw during COVID, there has been a big increase in the levels of retail investment, which is very, yeah. uh, very heartening. And there's, I think, and I'm sure you know better than me, uh, an increased proportion of women among those um, new in that new investor base. Um, and as you say, it is very important that we don't disappoint them at this early stage of their investment career um, and sort of by, by maybe misleading them as to, to what they are invested in. Um, and then they're disappointed when they get to the end and they find out actually, um, you know, I am invested in a whole lot of banks rather than investing in renewable energy. I think it's important, but I go one step back again, because through SCM, we launched in July last year a brand called Money Sheet, which is yes. actually specifically for educating women. It's not we don't sell products through Money Sheet. It is a, a knowledge platform for trying to uh, increase confidence more than anything else. And one of the things we've discovered since July last year and, and since the launch of Money Sheet is um, and we have a sort of a, a, a shared experience. So you know we have a, a we have women can send us their experience actually across not just investments but across the um, financial services sector. And we really is important that we experiences that these women are talking about. So it's fantastic and it's so important that we increase the number of female clients that we have as an industry. But their experience when they first front confront us is not a positive experience. The language is prohibitive. The, um, the if you like, annoyance we show, naive questions, but actually everybody, no question is stupid. It's, you know, the old saying, it's no stupid question, just people who don't ask a question. Um, but 
careful about the way we nurture those new female influencers, but not just female, but it's something I particularly can speak to because of Manishi and the experience that we've, we've seen, is that, and women are good at sharing their bad experiences. And that's something that women talk to more women than a man, a man will talk to one or two, or women will speak to a group. So the amplification of bad experiences is something we have to be aware of. Whereas they will also, their women will also talk about good experiences. So it's the fact that they will share good and bad experiences. So we need to ensure and take a bit more time and invest more in the experience we give a new female customer. Because I think that then leads to, they become our messenger, our brand ambassadors, if you like, and our product ambassadors. And they will tell other women and they'll tell their kids and they'll tell their children. You know, so if you think about it, that investment has payback two or three times, because if you take the time, and that's what we try to do, you take a bit longer. I mean, it's something the industry has told me for years now. It takes a lot more to a female client than it does a male client. And, and they, you know, it's not worth it. Actually, they tend to be stickier clients, if you like. They will amplify and they will share their experience more. So actually, the investment tends to be paid back in the two to threefold. Um, and I, I do want to come on and ask you sort of some more questions in a moment. But um, and in particular, I'd like to come back to sort of how you integrate ESG factors into your own uh, offerings um, at SCM. But I, just before I do that, I'd also like to remind the audience that you can submit questions. So I know this is a fireside chat between Gina and me, um, but I would be delighted to put questions um, on the audience's behalf to Gina. And if you would like me to do so. Um, please write a question into the Q&A Q &A box and I will, I will pick that up and then um, put it to Gina. But Gina, just to come back, we've obviously been talking about ESG. SEM has um, your own service. How do, you, how do you incorporate ESG into your portfolios there? So we, have, uh, we do have an ESG ethical portfolio, um, a, a systematic, if you like, analysis of opportunities and costs. Um, and, you know, we look at, you know, some Yes. House. When we look, we, we have, have to look as we do with everything beyond, beyond the title of the fund or whatever it says on the, the, the name, name of the tin, as it were. The quality of some of the ESG funds has not been what we would like to see in the market, and I think this will grow both from the t from terms of diversity that we're looking for um, in these uh, products and uh, and liquidity. Is it? We we still look at that. It's, it's about looking at the fundamentals, fundamentals. and that, that doesn't change if we're looking at ESG looking at our other portfolios but I think the, the, the product choice will increase and and I think that's fantastic um, as we go forwards but again there's too many products in the just we need to see more products that are looking at sustainable the, the S and yeah. And you, you, you mentioned that, that some products don't have the diversity you're looking for. Do you mean in terms of the, the team managing the, the, the product? Or? No. As we hold, um, we are looking at that maybe it has three underlying holdings or 30, sorry, underlying holdings is not something we look at. So we're looking at, you know, what is that index made up of? Well, the indices themselves can be too narrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just coming on to sort of the, the question of trust um you know, which is obviously you know the work that that you have done to sort of focus attention on some of the sort of deficiencies um in the market and areas where you have concerns and your call for sort of greater transparency of investment holdings is intended to to build um consumer trust the how important do you think diversity and inclusion is to the the campaign to to raise levels of trust in the investment profession it, it's absolutely vital because a culture has to be built on solid moral grounds if you like um and uh one of those cornerstones or the the, the if you like the foundations of that ground that you build up the inclusion on is trust and it it works you of consumers coming to you as an industry but also, how do we actually amplify our inclusion as a sector? Because 
pre-COVID again, to give you an example, I a networking event for Black and Asian women or ethnic minority um, individuals in the city. They were pretty young, this was a 30-odd age group. And I was struck by the numbers who were telling me that their families actually were not happy that they were coming or uh, entering the city uh, because they saw it as a place that wasn't trusted, it had wasn't behaving well, it was dishonest. So they were having to fight to justify coming into our profession because their families were trying them and get them to go into other professions. And that was very much around trust. It's not only down, I think, oh, we're being viewed being with suspicion from our consumers, missing out on attracting the brightest and the best because of this fact that we are not seen as a trusted industry and not being able to deliver to our consumers and our consumers first. So I think there is, we're losing out on both sides. So I think the trust deficit absolutely has to be part of the inclusion uh, debate. And when we talk about inclusion, trust has to be a very important element of it. I mean, if You want to go into an industry. Why would you want to walk into the doors of an organization if the team is saying, well, we don't trust you? Mm. But I suppose one could one could sort of make the same claim about sort of big tech or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, more fossil fuel sectors. I mean, I'm not suggesting that necessarily we don't want to be trusted. Or politics. You know, or, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Exactly. I think there's quite a significant trust deficit probably there. <laughs> But uh, it is, I mean, it's some, it is a bit tragic because it does feel as though, um, you know, this is a profession that takes a great deal of trouble to to manage other people's money carefully and to do so in a way that meets the investment objectives that those individuals have. But, um, you know, sometimes perhaps people say, well, we... I have to add... Please. But, Bill, there is a legacy to here. Uh, I think there's a legacy issue here. Um, in that uh, we are still there, we're still in tarred with the financial crisis, the Wall Street. There's still, there is a, if you like, a, a um, almost an entertainment value with bashing our industry. And, you know, they, it, it's somehow seen as, it, you know, it is the thing. Yeah, tarred by brush, but. I worry that we don't step up and defend ourselves enough. And we haven't, when I talked about which and putting our house in order and celebrating what it is we're doing, I'm not sure that we are good enough at doing that, at, at communicating the advancements we are made and actually countering some of that neg negative narrative and the almost cartoonization of our industry, bad bankers, whatever. And I'm sometimes ex uh, accused, and I'm very well aware easy uh, charge to lay at my feet but I say but what we need to do is when I say about putting out it's not just because I think we need to put things right because it's the right thing to do but I think it is actually the right thing to do for us to for that wrong perception and an outdated of what we are as an industry and the fact that we have worked hard and we are doing things but we're not going out there shouting at the rooftops about what it is we're doing and also I connect that with also being more active so it's about being more active and being more active in not just speaking about what we're doing but also sponsoring more initiatives in other sectors and going into education I mean I'm a great one I really think we ought to as an industry think about how we help the government bring financial education into the mainstream. I think, you know, financial inclusion, fraud. I mean, if you know what's happened during COVID, yes. Sir. Uh, I, f I fear we may have lost Gina for a moment. Ah, Gina, you're back. Still here. You are. Okay. okay, so I was going to say that during, the financial uh, during COVID, what's happened? We have had more people who have not had to spend money, so they've looked at investments, which is wonderful. But at the same time, we have, you know, fraud is now, financial fraud is now the biggest crime in the UK and not being addressed. And people are experiencing that. So what is their experience of financial services? They've been ripped off. They've been ex they have ex experienced fraud and then there's no redress. 
So the problem also I sometimes think is that what we do is we we are too narrow in our focus. We think about, well, we are investments. We haven't got to worry about the business. We yeah, have pensions or we are advisors. Other side of Jesus, they all being in industry. So that whatever the negative is, we all get hard by it. So I think we have to be very mindful of how we're seeing from the lens of the consumer and the general public, rather than us saying, well, be, and being very precious, well, we're doing the. We have to work, I'm afraid, harder than we are. Yes, we have not been, I think, good at terms of, in terms of sort of collective action, in terms of representing the, the value of the sector either to a political audience or to a sort of broader societal audience. And I think that is something that is... And many other industries are much better. You can look at the alcohol and industry, the tobacco and energy industry, industry whatever industry it is, they tend to... Hmm. Yeah, no, and, 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 and what, how do you think we should approach it? I think we have to do it on a collective basis. Uh, I think it's... There are in initiatives that are happening. There aren't enough that are happening on a industry-wide basis. Um, but I think education is maybe the place we could start. Which I suppose brings us back to the, the points you've been making about sort of in inclusion um, and sort of genuine inclusion that we need to, to sort of to take a bottom-up approach. Yes. rather than to assume that we organizationally can impose policies around diversity and inclusion that will provide solutions if those that are going to be subject to the policies don't see them as um, a, a positive means to, to, to progress. I mean, absolutely. I did the, the, the it sounds an odd talk to have given, but uh, it's from college and uh, I was talking about the importance of insurance, which they all thought was when they saw the title, they thought it would be the most boring talk they will ever hear. Yeah. But then I explained the story of lives as they go through their lives. And I talked to them about did they want to buy a house? Were they going to get a car? And I could. When they wanted, and this might do. I put in the insurance story into all of those. And suddenly they all thought, oh, actually, it is really important, isn't it? So it's something that we could perhaps get better at as well. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. And actually, my understanding is because there are a number of agencies who are doing quite good work um, in terms of bringing financial education um, into schools and universities. Um, and one of the things that they say is that um, young people's um, devotion to their mobile phones is actually giving them a good opportunity to to teach them about um, aspects of finance um, because yeah. clearly um, young people are actually rather good at calculating the the different benefits and the costs of different phone packages really to to quite um, uh, sophisticated um, levels of analysis um, and that's essentially a piece of uh, yeah that's a that's a financial product. Um, it yeah, is, okay. and I think one, well, I mean, one of the other ones will, I'd say, is, I think needs revisiting and as an industry, we could just perhaps not, <laughs> I have so much of my presence put out there. I think the, the platform of the money advice service is really a wasted opportunity because you've got that platform there, but it doesn't have the right, it is not communicating in the way fantastic opportunity there, and to have but it just, you know, it's like having the best baseball you can have, but unless it's in play, what's the point of having the best baseball? Um, um, you know, so I think revisiting how the language and the storytelling and that as a platform and using perhaps as an industry that we sit alongside them and help them develop something that can be used on mobile phones, could be used on other platforms, that could actually build in calculators. I think there's a really exciting opportunity to modernize and, re and energize that platform as something. Why reinvent or start from scratch when you've already got something? It just isn't perhaps communicating the way in the best possible way. Yeah. And do you think the fault there is that it is not sufficiently human? 
And, uh, I think and, it's yeah, very it's dry. It's not the platform, the platform's there, but it's a very dry state in some people who know how to sell Coca-Cola and washing powder and, you know, and how to, you know, some great young authors and do a competitions about, you know, the, the, the financial fairy for an eight-year-old, you know, that, that sort of thing, just exciting things that draw in different age groups and get people, you know, get into schools. It could be used as such a great platform, but I, there hasn't been enough innovation and imagination. Yeah. I, I think I read the, the 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 different the fairy book series to my children. I have to admit that I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to imagine how the story of um, you know uh, Fenella the financial fairy might might go. But I oh, don't yeah, worry, I made it up. Story. I made it up for my daughters. So, <laughs> you. how did it end? Oh, she was so empowered, and she grew old, and she looked back at her life. <laughs> Fantastic. But we've only got a couple of minutes left. And, you know, I was going to ask sort of what what one piece of advice would you give to those that are listening in this afternoon in terms of uh, promoting inclusion uh, within the, the investment sector? One bit of advice, gosh, I think uh, start early. Look at things like your job, in, um, uh, your, your job adverts, because I'm, I'm tired of hearing the excuse that, yes, but we didn't have people from X groups applying, you know, really think about how it is you actually present and your organization and those jobs. And the second thing I'd say is it's about to move to um, perhaps away from diversity and inclusion, which I know is a big quality and opportunity, and to talk more about neurodiversity as well. Because, you know, I, I'll qu quote before we go, the I said, it won't be a world, it will be a world. One equal access for opportunities. And I think that's actually not just about women, I think everybody. So I, I would say let's think about how we use language in a way we can be more transformative and how we actually open our arms and welcome people in and be seen to be welcoming and trusted and inclusive. That's very kind. Thank you. And I suppose my final question would be what's next for you? Yeah, you know, what what can we expect to see? Where can we expect to see you popping up in the news next? Mind. So a month ago, a party, which you know, the the, re, the the name for the party, it's not easy to find a name for a political party, but it's also. I think it's time we audited a political landscape. Uh, I think what we're seeing is a product of systemic failure. We will. Yeah, the other industry. We, talk about, we talked about sustainability and governance. Well, we need to get those um, principles into politics. And that's what I'm standing for. And that's what I'm going to be pushing for is that we are failures and we create a more inclusive, diverse political environment and party politics that means that we can deliver more to our end customers, the voters. Well, that sounds extremely interesting, and we wish you the very best of luck. And thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. And thank, thank you, you my pleasure. You, uh, for joining us for this session. Um, in a few moments' time, uh, there will be a message from Mark Franklin, who is the CEO and president of CFA Institute, about CFA Institute's new diversity, equity, and inclusion code, um, and how that operates and why, that we, why we have worked on that and introduced it. And following that, there will be then more of a, uh, a detailed look at the code um, in a session, uh, our last session of the day, um, that will start, I think, at um, four o'clock. But uh, for now, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next session.